Okay, welcome to the opening video for our summer class 2022. Uh, our best selves uh, is this module in the larger frame of complexity and justice. Also something I've called interpersonal nonviolence, but that's a term that I've used for a different class. So I want to try and separate these out. What I want to do with this program this summer is to present kind of all of the work that I have been able to pull together around a particular topic, which is how do we become our best selves? There are certain things that we do to become our best selves by eating right, by getting exercise, there are all kinds of things you can, you know, there are magazines that come out every month telling you all the ways you can be your best self. I want to focus particularly on an aspect of our being our best selves, which is one that, um, I want to illustrate for you by sharing with you this uh, this particular video. You've probably seen something like this before. Um, this is a murmuration of starlings. This is over a field in some place in the south of England. And you can find lots of these videos because these are just so beautiful if you just watch the way they're flying. You see they're changing direction. Different groups of them out at the same time. And at some point, the various groups seem to fold together. This lovely coordination of their action. And as humans have enjoyed this dance, we've also scientifically wondered, how is it that the starlings do this? Which, which of the birds is in charge? Which one's telling them how to fly and where to go? What is the hierarchy that's inherent within this murmuration of starlings? And it turns out what we've discovered is that there's actually no hierarchy there at all. They're all following a particular set of rules, how fast to fly, how far apart to be, which way to turn when they come to the edge, as they turn back into the group so that this cloud folds in upon itself. There are actually computer programs that simulate this, showing spots that move in a direction at a particular speed, at a particular distance, having particular rules to follow, and they can, can actually emulate these kinds of patterns. So it's not that there is one starling that is in charge, but that of all of the starlings in, in their cooperation with each other form a kind of overmind or supermind that allows them to do this beautiful dance together. So we want to learn how we can do that as humans. How can we be in our capacity to be in relationship with each other such that we are actually creating these beautiful patterns in human experience? So what we're doing here is we're looking at how do we show up in our relationship with ourselves, our relationships with each other, and how we as a related community form um, our connections with other parts of the human community in such a way that we can address and resolve the problems that we experience on planet Earth today. There are some very huge issues that are uh, confronting us. The climate catastrophe, polarizations politically, the COVID pandemic and other pandemics that loom. Uh, 
financial inequality, uh, in, inequality of privilege. There's all kinds of things that are issues that are the, uh, threat, gun violence, that are threatening to destroy the human community. And the thing that all of these uh, problems have in common is that they're all created by humans. And thus, we, if we can just get our shit together, we can resolve these. So we have to find new ways of being that are actually going to do a better job of uh, helping us to create uh, a, a way of being in the world that's evolutionarily uh, advanced. Evolution is moving along and we will either evolve or we will become dinosaurs. All right. So in the last hundred years, there's a lot of been a lot of work that's been done around the whole idea of how it is that we construct uh, ourselves and ourselves in relationships with others. And so one of these is uh, uh, one of the early pieces of work here was done by a guy by the name of Abraham Maslow. And you've probably seen this hierarchy of needs, something that I experienced probably in college. I can't remember exactly when it was, but I do remember that when I saw it, I could understand what physiological needs are, I'm, you know, safety, love and belonging, that's pretty important, esteem, but what does it mean to be self-actualized? And I was aware that I really didn't know what he meant by that, but I did know that I wanted it. So this is a class for people who want to be self-actualized. There are lots of people in the world that are happy if they can simply find the remote. They're just living their lives sort of mindlessly. They've, they've gotten to a place where they know that they have these lower order needs met and um, they're struggling with uh, perhaps questions of safety or love and belonging. Uh, or maybe they don't feel like they have the esteem that they need. But there are some of us who have been privileged to have those needs met so well that we're really going for the top. We really want to be self-actualized. So in one sense, what this course is about is helping us figure out, well, what does that mean? And, and how is it that I might get there? How might I get to the place where self-actualization is really a possibility for me? <clears throat> now, there's a lot of things about this cognitive map, this map of, um, of a, a, the hierarchy of needs that Abraham Maslow has giving, given us. Uh, that are worthy of some deeper attention, but I want to just touch on a few of them really quickly. The most common uh, learning that we get from this is that when the lower order needs are not met, uh, the higher order needs will not be um, fulfilled. If I don't have a place to sleep tonight, I'm really not worried about things like love and belonging or self-esteem. Uh, I, I need a hot meal. But when the lower order needs are met and I do have a place and I'm safe and I have, uh, I have people who care for me and I care for them, then we begin to move to the higher order needs. We will naturally begin to go up. For most of us, and certainly I think for all of us in this conversation, the lower order needs are primarily met most of the time and that for most of us, love and belonging is the area that we're working on. How do I create stable and just and harmonious relationships with others? So that's going to be our target for the most part as we seek to move to these higher levels. But when I say move to the higher levels, we are all actually at all of the levels all the time. The question is, the tasks of living that face me right now, at what, at what order in this hierarchy do they arise? Because we have to be meeting them all, all at the same time to some degree. And in fact, we all exist at all of them. We are all, in some sense, involved in this process of self-actualization, whether we do it consciously or not. All right? So... <clears throat> So our beginning task here is to get oriented into how it is that we become our best selves by being ourselves right here and now, being this sort of one-pointed awareness. Where am I coming from? Where am I grounded? What am I rooted in? Turns out that being able to be ourselves and to be in the moment 
and to be spatially grounded where we are. Turns out that doing that is actually more difficult than it might otherwise seem. We do it by the formation of certain kinds of cognitive maps by which we determine, okay, so this is who I am. This is what's happening right now. This is where I am. But where I am, for example, um, where is here? Here is spatially, I am in a particular place. My body is in a particular place, but I'm, my head may be someplace else, or I may be in a particular relationship. And so I'm in the space of that relationship. One of the things that some of us have talked about recently is the whole idea of holding space for someone else. What spaces am I holding or am I being held in? So a part of the here is not just about geographically or materially where I am, physically where I am, but emotionally or spiritually where am I? So this is a, this is a complex problem to know who we are, where we are, and when we are. And so we, um, we're going to expand our understanding of this map a little bit because any map is going to tell us uh, certain things like where am I, where might I be, and how might I get there. If you, if you pick a map, up a map of the festival, whatever festival you're going to, it's going to say, okay, here's where the gates are. Here's how you get in. And on that map, we're going to try to figure out, okay, well, where am I now? Because, oh, here's where the food court is and I'm hungry. I want to go towards the food court. So since I'm in right here and the food court's over there, what direction do I need to go? This is going to be our fundamental kind of orienting map for how it is that we uh, find our best selves. Um, any kind of map is going to give us direction about who it is and where we are, uh, where it is that we might go. But some maps are more complex than others. So the next module that we're going to get into, or the module on complexity and justice, is really about understanding what complexity is and that it's um, a way of making sense of the chaos of the world that does a more robust job of explaining what is than do simple maps. Now, I really want my maps to be as simple as possible because then I can make sense of them. So any map, if it's really going to be something that's going to work for us, it has to be simple enough that we can get our heads around it. It also has to be current because the map of last year's festival is really not going to help me this year because it's not, it's, they, they moved things around. And it has to be relevant. There are certain things that I want to have be on this map that are not necessarily going to be on, on, on another map of, of that same territory. When, when you go on Google Maps and you're looking for someplace, you can hit those little icons that say restaurants or gas stations, and they will light up where are the restaurants or gas stations, because that's the relevant information for you now. So in just that way, we need to know what is relevant for us to know such that we can figure out where we are, where we might be, and how it is that we can get there. So our, our maps are going to have to be more complex than simply the complicated ones or the, even the simple ones that we already use or have, have learned to use, have been taught to use by our life experience. Okay, so in the moment that we find ourselves, there's going to be this choice that we have to make about how it is that we're going to show up. So Viktor Frankl tells us here that between stimulus and response, there is a space. If you can imagine that space, something happens, but before I respond to it, there's a kind of space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. It's both how we grow and how we become free. The last of the human freedoms is the one to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. So there's this, between the arising and the arousing, there is a space, there is a moment in which we make a choice. And that choice gives us the power to create our lives. And that moment may be a millisecond or it may take many years. So we're looking at this interface between the arising and the arousing. What is it that's actually happening? And what is it that we do to address what is actually happening? The thing is, we can't actually know what's actually happening. 
we're busy making meaning. That's what humans are. We are meaning makers. So we're going to make meaning of what it is that's going on. Um, and the way we make sense of what is arising for us leads us to respond in a patterned way. So if I notice that my shoe is untied, my patterned response is to tie my shoe. And I tie my shoe the same way all the time, even though last time I tied it, it didn't work because my, my shoe came untied, right? But there are certain patterned things that we do. We learn specific ways of being that respond to certain circumstances. Whatever is arising, I already have a default response. This is what I always do when this happens, right? So different circumstances call forth from us different ways of being. So I'm going to respond differently when my shoes are untied than when my, my fly is open or, or when uh, my wife is angry with me about something or when my kids are crying. So I'm going to have different pattern of responses to different circumstances. Each circumstance will call forth a different way of being. What we're looking for here is to discover more inclusive, that is more complex ways of making meaning such that we begin to act out in new ways of being. I don't want to keep doing what I've always done. I want to do something different that works better because what healthy means, a healthy organism, is one which does a better and better job of creating or gathering what it is that it needs. So we're all about being able to create what we need. Right? So these maps can tell us, any of the maps, any of these cognitive maps that we use can tell us three different things. That is where we are, where we might be, and what direction do we need to follow to get there. <clears throat> so I'm going to call these initial, con initial conditions or icons. Um, the where we might be is an asymptote or an asym. And what direction we might need to go is a vector or a vect, just we're going to simplify it down here. So all of our ma maps are going to develop these three qualities for us. Right? Uh, <clears throat> so let me just be clear here about um, what an asymptote is. I'm going to actually, here, I'm going to go to this one. This was, if we're looking at, at the initial conditions, this is a map of uh, the, for the hurricanes in the Atlantic. Uh, in a particular year, they were tropical storms. They didn't all become hurricanes. And you can see where it is that they go. They all started in pretty much the same place. They all had very similar initial conditions, but they didn't end up in the same place because there are other things that in, um, informed them. Okay, so this is what I mean by initial conditions. Where does this whole thing start? Where am I right now? I, in this, you know, Today is the first day of the rest of my life. It's sort of like these are the initial conditions for the rest of my life. An asymptote is a particular kind of mathematical function in which the line approaches, but it never quite reaches its goal. So what we're talking about here in terms of asymptotes is that there are certain things that we can approach. We will never fully grasp them. So I want to approach trust in my most significant relationships. But trust is not something that is, it's not binary. It's not either there or it's not. It's more or less there. And it's more or less there because of what I do to create it. So I want to be someone who creates more and more trust. I want to be on this graph leaning towards, moving towards more and more trust. Trust in this case would be the red line. All right. And we're also talking about vectors. Vectors are something that move in a particular direction. It has a starting place, which is where I am now, and where it is that I'm headed. And it has, um, it's going in the direction of the head. It has a particular magnitude, how forceful is it, and what direction is it going. So we're going to be developing, uh, refining uh, various kinds of cognitive maps that teach us these things such that we can begin a process of moving just as a hurricane or a tropical storm moves. We're moving through our lives, hopefully not doing so much damage. <clears throat> but we're starting with these initial conditions. If you notice, um, the initial condition here is 11 p.m. on Monday. And this is the track that they're predicting that this hurricane is going to move. And once it gets out here, it gets it gets more and more fuzzy in terms of where it's going because we don't actually know where it is that's going to go, but we can chart it out. So 
what direction am I intending to move in? Right. So <clears throat> I want to suggest these um, questions for your reflection so you can prepare for Thursday evening. So around initial conditions, what makes it hard for you to stay in the here and now? What's, what, what distracts you into pay, remembering the past or kvetching about what has happened to you? Or how does your future distract you from what it is you're doing in this moment? What, what makes it hard for you to be centered in you? And in terms of an asymptote, what are you headed towards? What drives you forward? What are your goals? What, what are you urgent to create in your life? What's the purpose for your being? What do you know about what you're about in your life? And in terms of vectors, um, when do you find yourself acting aimlessly? When are you not directed? And, and when you're not directed, how do you discover clarity about what you need? And how do you evaluate your choices so as to be confident that you are acting, create what, what you need? So, so be thinking about these three questions and we will return to them Thursday evening. As we begin our conversation, kind of moving us through this summer together. All right, a couple more things that I want to tell you about where it is that we're going here. All right. So as we are looking, this is a subway map here. We're trying to figure out where we are, where we're going, how we would need to get there, right? As I move forward, as I'm, as I'm this hurricane or this tropical storm moving forward, I will be in a new place. I will have a new initial conditions and I'll have new options. Uh, and I will be expressing a new way of being. So in every moment, we're gonna be moving through our lives in a dynamic way, right? So we want to open ourselves to the possibility of a new way of being, uh, which is not just a more comprehensive map. Some one of the ways we, we build our cognitive maps is we add on this and we add on that. And so we're uh, putting together a more complete map just by the process of accretion. But we're actually going to be looking at some things that are paradigm changes. There have been times in your life when something shifted so dramatically that you came to see yourself, your life differently. It was like, okay, now things are different. I remember um, when in my first marriage, um, my wife and I were headed to the hospital before the birth of our first child. And I realized that I was on the cusp of a paradigm change. I was for here on going to be a father and I hadn't been before. And this is a game changer. So there are certain things that happen in our lives that change fundamentally how we see ourselves and what's happening around us. And they create not just new ways of be being in the sense of there's, oh, I've got a new task. It's like this changes everything. All of those old maps, uh, if, they're, if I don't throw them out, I at least have to revise them because this is such a fundamental difference. All right, so that's part of what we're going to be looking for here is a paradigmatic, paradigmatic change in ourselves. Right? So <clears throat> this is essentially a matter of being able to figure out how it is that I know what I need. If a, if a healthy organism is, organism is one that moves towards what it needs, what do I need? And the way that we know what we need is by noticing when we're not getting what we need. I'm not getting what I need when I'm getting hurt. If I'm feeling hurt, it means I'm not getting what I need or I am getting something that I don't need, which means that part of what we're doing here is we're paying attention to what are the issues, the problems, the difficulties, the ouches that arise in our life, right? So <clears throat> if I wanna know what I need, I have to know how I feel and I especially need to know when I feel bad and we don't like to feel bad. And so we repress our awareness of such feelings and thus we aren't aware that, of, that we aren't getting what we need. We think, oh, I'm fine. Everything's, everything's cool, right? And thus I'm not motivated to move towards what I need. I don't approach it. So if I really want this transformation in my life, I have to be willing to feel my bad feelings. I have to be open to the feelings that I most don't want to feel because that's the place that of the opportunity for my greatest transformation. So what we're gonna be looking at soon is this whole question of what is conflict as a kind of source of discord in me and my life and my relationships with others. But for the moment, just be thinking about what is the, what is the feeling you most don't want to feel? 
of all of the feelings, the, all of the emotions and sensations that arise for you, what is the one that you least want? And lean into that one. So uh, as a kind of catalog of the bad feelings, the central bad feeling is hurt. I'm getting what I don't need. I'm not getting what I do need. But future tense, uh-oh, this is going to hurt. We call that fear. Past tense, oh, wow, that was awful. That loss, I feel sad. When I make a choice that hurts somebody else, I feel guilty. When somebody else makes a choice that hurts me, I feel anger. So these are the five basic bad feelings. So as you consider this, which are the ones that you most don't want to feel? Because leaning into them will acquaint you with what it is you're not getting. It will help you discover what it is you need that you're not yet able to create for yourself. Okay, <clears throat> now we're going to be able to, we're going to have to act on these in such a way that we're showing up differently in our lives. And to be able to do that, we have to know that there's a problem. Because if there's no problem, I'm not changing. But it's not just that there is a problem, it has to be my problem. It, it, in some sense, this is a problem for me. And maybe I didn't create it, but as it arises, it's arising for me. And it's big enough that, that this, I want to do something about it. So I'm going to have to figure out what it is that I might do that would actually create more of what it is that I need. And that's, that's the central task of this course is to figure out what might I do differently that would create more of what I need or what we need collectively. Right? So I have to have a plan. So I can have a plan, but that doesn't mean I'm going to actually adopt the plan. So I have to be willing to live into a new way of being. I have to be willing to change me in order to move towards what it is that I need. And I have to believe that I'm competent, that this is a plan that I can actually implement and that I'm worth it. And it's only if I have all of these seven preconditions that I'm actually going to be able to act. So this is fairly robust, fairly at least complicated, if not complex in how it is that we come to, to solve these issues, right? <clears throat> so there are three orienting questions. And these are things we're gonna go into with more depth as we meet for our conversation on Thursday evening. And these are the, these are the questions that help us get started in this task. The first is, um, do you have permission to create what you need? I mean, you may be able to figure out what you need, but do you have permission to create it? And most of us would say pretty quickly, well, sure, why, you know what, who, who would stop? Who can, nobody can deny me the permission to create what I need, right? And yet, many of us do discover that we're stuck, that there are certain things that are barriers to us being able to kind of give ourselves permission. And certainly a part of it is, if I don't know what I need, how am I going to give myself permission to create it? The second question has to do with the degree to which I find this bothersome, and is it bothersome enough that I'm willing to change what I'm doing? Me? Why should I change what I'm doing? It's not my fault. It's not about fault. It's not about being bad or wrong. It's about being willing to transform ourselves such that we can create more of what we need. It doesn't have to be our fault, but we do have to be responsible. We do have to be response-able. And the final orienting question is we have to be able to pick one thing to work on. Oh, but there's so many things. Okay, brother, pick one. Oh, but I don't know. Maybe I'll pick the wrong. No, just pick one. It doesn't matter which one it is. It does matter that we pick one because we cannot deal with everything all at once. It's hard enough to deal with one thing. We can't deal with everything. And so, as you probably heard, the way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time, but I have to figure out where, where am I starting on this elephant that is the issues that arise in my life. So do you have permission to create what you need? Are you bothered enough by it to be able to be willing to change yourself? And what's the one thing that you want to work on? All right, so um, we're going to be getting together on Thursday evening. I'm going to be sending you a link uh, that I it's the same one I always use. Some of you have already been on Zoom with me, so, but I will refresh it. Uh, there's a half a dozen of us that are going to be getting together in this conversation, and I'm really excited to get started. So 
I'll see you Thursday.